The last part in our exploration of biology and psychology in the 19th century is Freud, psychodynamics and the unconscious. Now, no, no history of psychology would be complete without a bit of Freud. So here it is. Um, and the only real objective I think you have for, for this session is, um, is just to be able to describe and evaluate some of the Freudian and psychodynamic concepts. And they're pretty crazy. So uh, let's have a go and, and see what, what there is. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of Freudian ideas about personality, about, about child development, psychosexual development, about defense mechanisms, how people cope with challenges to their psychosexual development, and also some, some scientific and conceptual criticisms of, of all of this psychodynamic theory. And you can probably tell from my tone that my personal view is that Freudian psychodynamics um, should really be given the same sort of status as phrenology in the 19th century. So, you know, it's a, potent it's a potentially good idea, maybe at the time, um, but we shouldn't mistake this for a scientific idea. So Freud was influenced by the, in the late 1800s, um, scientists and neurologists um, studying hysteria and Charcot in France and Breuer in Austria, as well as Darwin's influences on, um, on his biological theories. So women with hysteria, and it was almost exclusively women, displayed anxiety, irritability, highly sexualized behavior, maybe breathlessness and spasms. And social and cultural factors were important in hysteria. So there's, there's not much hysteria around today, but if, if there is, it might be called conversion disorder. And in the early days, Freud came up with um, a theory called seduction theory to try and explain hysteria. Um, but this didn't work out. and I don't know much about it. And we're going to move on to what he did instead. So Freud is well known for his theory his psychodynamic theory of consciousness and psychosexual development. And in Freud's psychodynamic theory, there are three levels of consciousness. The consciousness, uh, a pre-consciousness, and an unconsciousness. And much like the iceberg analogy here, the idea is that an awful lot of our mental life and our mental processes are actually below the surface. They're unconscious and they're driven by instincts, uh, repressed memories, and these biological drives that we're not really aware of. So two of these drives in particular, and these sort of came from um, evolutionary theory in a way, sort of a, str a struggle for life, like an, an eros, a life instinct, as well as thanatos, a death instinct. And through these drives, Freud is really channeling sort of evolutionary ideas about the sort of survival for the fittest, so the survival and the struggle for life. In the Freudian personality, here's the iceberg again, um, you've got as well uh, three different sections it's, it's quite handy to have three um conscious pre-conscious and unconscious is what we've talked about before so the consciousness is the iceberg above the water there but the, the personality is divined divided also into the super ego the ego and the id super ego is sort of like your internalized morality system so societal pressures and rules maybe your your parents or your teachers or the or the authorities that's sort of a a, a, a supervisory set of principles by which you live. And there's the ego, which is mostly your your conscious self is mostly your ego. Um, and it's driven by something Freud called the reality principle. The id is your animal, the beast at the middle of your being. And this is selfish and animalistic. And this beast is driven by the pleasure principle. So it's looking to satisfy his needs or her needs and desires. And these forces, these, these um, parts of the personality, as well as the forces and the drives which drive us to do things, there's a struggle for supremacy between these forces, and that why, that's why it's called psychodynamics, this sort of interaction, this dynamic interaction. The second part of Freudian theory, which is starting to get a bit weird, is about psychosexual stages. So in Freud's view, um, child development proceeds through five stages focusing on different bodily areas. So in the oral stage at the beginning, the baby is learning to feed from the mother's breast, but also to wean themselves off this food. So there's a lot of oral interactions in the first stage of life. In the second stage of life, 
the child learns to control its toilet's behavior. Uh, and Freud then calls this the anal phase of psychosexual development. Um, after learning to use the toilet, um, there's the phallic stage, uh, where the relationship between the child and the parents becomes more interesting, and this is three to six years old. There's then a latent stage where nothing much happens after the six-year-old is developed uh, until puberty. And then puberty occurs and the genital stage is the final stage of development. And that's where that's sort of the ultimate goal, if you like, of psychosexual development. And in Freud's view, if you had problems in any one of these stages, maybe your needs weren't being met, you could become fixated at these stages. And this fixation, it's like your personality would stop developing and you'd have certain problems related to the stage at which you stopped. So fixation then can determine later personality and behaviour if conflicts are not resolved. And Freud said that oral fixation, so if you get fixate, fixated at the first level, oral fixations would end up with neuroses and compulsive behaviours, smoking, chewing gum, eating and drinking disorders, for example. And you'll note that Freud there is, is holding a cigarette, a cigar. Anal fixations, if you get fixate, fixated at the second stage, um, could lead you to be a sort of retentive person, anally retentive it's called, um, and you'd be fastidious, you'd be, you're very picky over over how you how you behave day to day, stingy, so you might be quite um, well, well, stingy, tight, not willing to give people money and things, uh, you might be very clean, uh, or expulsive behaviour, so anally expulsive he would call it, and this is Freud's way of describing why you might overshare things or be a bit messy or disorganized or inconsiderate. Then another later stage, a phallic fixation, you might show more extremes of dominant and submissive behavior. Now, uh, this is all very interesting. Um, how it, not everyone obviously gets fixated at these stages. So partly that's because we're able to uh, defend ourselves from the, the traumas and the uh, conflicts that arise at these stages. And we do this by using our defense mechanisms. And there's a lot of them. And this is pretty important for Freud's theory. Um, so if, ever, if anything ever doesn't quite fit his theory, he can just bring in one of the uh, one of the eight defense mechanisms here to explain why something did or didn't happen. It's very handy. So if you have some sort of psychosexual conflict at one of your stages, uh, this will create anxiety and stress. And one response to this stress is to... Uh, bring in one of your defense mechanisms. So you could repress these conflicting feelings, these stressful things. You could push them down into your unconsciousness. And that's what people do with the Oedipus and Electra complex. And if you've repressed it, of course, you can't tell the psychotherapist that uh, that's what's causing your problem. Uh, you can't tell them that because it, you've repressed it. Uh, so the psychotherapist can just work it out. You know, that, that must be what's going on. Another defense mechanism is identification. So you can align yourselves with the enemy. For example, if you have, um, if you actually have some conflict with your with your parents, so your father or your mother, um, you could maybe identify with your parents and actually, you know, have a have a better relationship with them. But in fact, they're they're the enemy. So although you're behaving in a way that might be aligning, identifying with the parent, for Freud that actually means that you're um, repressing the need to uh, to fight with them. A reaction formation is like the opposite. So instead of identifying with someone, you actually show an exaggerated opposition to them. So you might, you may perhaps you're perhaps you're really in love with your father, but um, you show an exaggerated um, hatred or, or dislike of your father. Or perhaps someone who wants to burn down houses will will choose a career in the fire service. Projection is when we attribute our thoughts onto other people. For example, when, when a cheat might accuse you of cheating. Rationalization, and um, this is the kind of thing that uh, <laughs> Donald Trump might do, uh, excusing or devaluing actions or things that he's done or said in the past. I didn't want it anyway. I was being sarcastic. I didn't mean it when I asked you to inject bleach. I, I was being sarcastic. Totally. Displacement, that's when you shift your stresses onto another object. So that's, that's called sort of kicking the cat syndrome. Regression, when you revert to an earlier stage of development. For example, you might suck your thumb or curl up in bed with a teddy bear. Or you could just deny it outright. Someone says you're an urban, a lemon, and you're in fact an orange, and you say, yeah, I'm a lemon. So you just deny it. Now all these forces are interacting and, and 
and pushing us around and creating all these conflicts in us. And this can cause many psychosexual conflicts and disorders. And some of these complexes that Freud talked about were, uh, so the Oedipus complex was that boys would develop sexual feelings for their mother um, and they would develop jealousy and resentment towards their father, obviously. Um, and now boys would be afraid of their father um, because, you know, the boys, the father might castrate them. So boys develop this castration anxiety of fear that the father will chop off their bits obviously. Um, and similarly in, in girls, uh, they don't have a penis. So uh, obviously what they really want is, is to have a penis. Um, so that's why they develop penis envy. And along with that, they might develop an Electra complex, which is where they start having sexual feelings for their father, jealousy and resentment towards their mother. This is all, you know, common sense. One, one thing at least that Freudian did give us is the Freudian slip. And this is when everyday thoughts and actions are um, somehow revealing of what we really wanted or or they're just mistakes. But they, sometimes they can be meaningful mistakes. So as this nice cartoon shows, a Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but you mean your mother. I, I mean another. And Freud thought everyday slips and lapses like this are actually quite important signals about what's really in your unconsciousness. And they come out in dreams as well. So the point of all this theory is so that um, you can pay your psychoanalyst uh, for, a, for an hour's session every once a week for five to 10 to 50 years. Um, and you can go through psychoanalysis to release the forces of unconscious conflicts by making them conscious on the couch. And this process of making the unconscious conscious is called abreaction, I believe, in Freudian psychoanalysis. So in psychoanalysis, you lie on the couch in a sort of semi-hypnotic state, and you reveal your traumas to the analyst. And these could be slips of the tongue, uh, the free association of ideas. You could be talking about the contents of dreams or just meanings of things, that little things that happen in the day-to-day -day life. And the analyst, analyst would listen and then come up with a story to explain all of this stuff. So now we come to assessing whether Freud's psychodynamics is really evidence-based. So all scientific theories need evidence, and we shouldn't just take Freud's explanations at face value. So let's take a look at the evidence for Freud's theories. So Freud, in his project and in his psychoanalysis, believed that he was creating a theory of universal human nature. The problem was it was based on a very limited number of quite troubled, rich Viennese patients around 1900. So that's a criticism that, you know, it's not a universal theory of human nature. It's a very particular cultural, um, limited in time and space and, uh, you know, a particular section of society. And you could probably find some evidence of these sort of psychosexual stages and their importance to human infants and development. For example, potty training, you know, it's probably quite important or learning to feed attachment to the mother. There's probably a lot of stuff out there that sort of makes some sense in terms of Freudian theory. But this is not because of Freud's evidence that, that these things make sense. This is either just common sense or it's stuff that comes that came much later. So Freud didn't publish much of his evidence. And the stuff that he did publish has been quite heavily criticised over the years. And so I think as experimental psychologists and scientists in you know, the 21st century, I think we really need to apply quite strict principles about what counts as science in the history of psychology. You know, we've, we've discounted phrenology and we've discounted physiognomy um, and we've criticised the scientific racism of the 19th century. So what, what might a philosopher of science say about Freud? Well, a very simple thing to do is just to ask Karl Popper here. And Karl Popper's, one of his main ideas was that scientific theories should be falsifiable. And we're going to hear a lot more about this in weeks nine and ten. And by falsifiable, Popper meant that if a theory cannot even in principle be proved wrong, then it just isn't science. Science doesn't deal with proving things true. It can only really falsify things. And you know, the latest hypothesis in science is just the best explanation of, of things as they currently are. 
but it's the best thing that hasn't yet been proven false. So de Freud's theories meet this criterion of falsifiability. Um, and I think the answer just has to be no, not at all. Freud's theories are so vague and they're so flexible that they cannot be falsified. If the majority of our consciousness is in fact unconscious, if the majority of our the components of our mind are unconscious and we can't possibly bring those components to the forefront of consciousness as evidence, then there, there can be no evidence for these things. So as I've sort of paraphrased down here, um, the psychoanalyst could say to the patient, you want to have sex with your father. And the patient, patient might rightly say, I do not. And the psychoanalyst will go, aha, that's denial. That's even more evidence that it must be true. This is not science. So was Freud a massive waste of time? Uh, I mean, it's been very influential. You know, Salvador Dali in this nice picture of melting clocks. He was very influenced by the idea of bringing up the unconscious and going into trance-like states and you know, letting his dreams rule, rule his you know, waking life and his consciousness. But I think a lot like phrenology and horoscopes and, and all sorts of other superstitions in art, in sociology, in literature, in the popular press and on telly and the radio, it can just be thought of as entertainment in a way. And perhaps a very rich, limited form of entertainment that certain people and certain times it's been fashionable. But it's not a scientific discipline. So yeah, there's some validity to the idea we have instincts and the evolutionary psychologists and the ethologists would certainly agree with that. And yes, of course, there's unconscious processes. You know, we definitely aren't aware of every single neuron in our brain firing or not firing. And yeah, there are defense mechanisms and we, we can talk about the things that we do. Denial is certainly a thing that people do. And yes, dreams can be important and illuminating and interesting. But all of this is just seems to be in the common understanding of, of psychological life. And I doubt that it was Freud who brought all of these things into being, who, who revealed all of these things to us. So at face value, Freud's theories, in my view, and this is a very personal view, don't have any well. There is no value. Um, and uh, just but taking just very simple things, simple, simple parts of his theory, say his theory of personality, the idea that we could get fixated at the oral stage and not progress anymore is just ludicrous. You know, the oral, the oral stage of development is, um, is just learning to feed. You know, you're, you're an infant. But it seems to be the case that people's personality changes long into adulthood and perhaps throughout life. So is it really the case that we've become fixated on the, the oral stage, age one or two of development? So in principle and in summary, um, and this I think is my is my personal view from you know being forced to teach Freud, um, the ideas have some interest and some validity, but this is fundamentally not what a science of the mind and behaviour looks like. So thank you to the... Uh, old white men who helped us on this final section of the lecture. Next week, you'll be finding out what a science of the mind and brain does look like in behaviorism and where it will be into psychology proper by then. So we've done all of the, the lead up to psychology in the 20th century. So I'll see you in the 20th century in a couple of weeks time. In the meantime, if you have any questions about this part or any other part of my lectures, then stick them on the Q&A and we'll chat about them next week. See you soon.